Good evening. Wow, very quiet, everybody. Uh, thank you for joining us this evening for the Border Chronicle. This evening, I have the unique pleasure of introducing Ima Vitelli, who is not only a close friend of NYU Florence, but a true inspiration to me. Um, Ima Vitelli is an international correspondent for Vanity Fair Italy, as well as a columnist for Marie Claire. Her report on Kobani actually just came out recently in the latest edition of Vanity Fair Italia. She's a true inspiration in her advocacy for human rights, and we are extremely honored to have her speak to us today. Thank you. Wow. <laughs> Thank you for inviting me. It's a pleasure to come back here. You wrote, it's just, the bar is too high, Claudia. Okay? I mean, what am I supposed to say now? It's just like a, a tremendously high, but not seriously. I'm always very happy to be back because I remember when I was 20 and trying to figure out who I wanted to be and what I wanted to do. And it was terrifying. And I was just scrambling for anybody who actually achieved anything to share whatever wisdom was out there. So I guess this is the reason why I like it so much to be talking to you this evening. So thank you for having me over. So you guys would all like to be columnists, right? Is that, is that the reason why you're all here? I guess so. <laughs> Well, I have bad news, and I'm trying, I will try like, for, the first, for the first five minutes or so to deter you, because why would you want to add your crap to the um, immense amount of crap that is already out there? <laughs> there is a lot of stuff, right? It's all over the place. It's on the web. It's on the internet. It's in any form you can find, and most of it is really bad. So unless you're really good, and unless you have some sort of obsession, and unless you really are prepared to put in a lot of work, and climb a mountain, and keep working, and struggling all the time, because it's not something that you do once and it's done, right? Unless you're prepared to do that, get a job at the post office or something different. You just, just forget about, you know, this is the number one thing. The other, the other thing is that you can't become a columnist unless you kind of become a person, which means a human being, an individual. So what is a column? Like we should start saying, it's like, what is a column in the end? A column is a page where someone, possibly with ideas, possibly with expertise, possibly who has mastered a territory, a turf, a landscape, an environment, something, tomatoes, soups, um, ices, um, the stock market, whatever. There is a person that we look up to for some wisdom, ideas. So a columnist, to begin with, should be someone who actually knows how to think and thinks for us, right? Somebody who knows how to think, that's tricky. So this is the first kind of thing. So you need to be able to think and you need to be able to develop your own ideas and you need to have an obsession. Now, let me take a step back and, and Claudia introduced me a little bit, but I'm really kind of a very weird columnist. Um, as she said, just back from Kobane, I'm a war correspondent. Um, I spent one week, you know Kobane, right? Kobane is in Syria on the border with Turkey. There has been a gruesome war for the past four or five months. And finally, on the 26th of February, the Kurdish resistance liberated the city, this city, right? And so as soon as the city was liberated, I crossed the border and I went to Kobane and I basically kind of um, observed what happened, the ruins, 70% of the city's leveled, and I fell in love with the women fighting against ISIS. So like the good news is there are women in the front line fighting the Islamic State. I thought it was great. I mean, 10 years of war reporting, never seen anything like that. Why well, I'm telling you this. 
Because you need to have an eye, and you need to observe, and you need to listen, and you need to discover, and you need to be curious. And it's part of the obsession I was talking about at the beginning, right? So I went to Kobane, open-hearted and open-minded. My eyes were wide open, and I was hanging out with the commander. And I discovered that the commander of the, of the troops, the ground troops in Kobane, who kicked the butt of ISIS, is a woman. Now, that's a column. That's a column. Why is a column? Because it kind of defies every single stereotype and cliche that we know about war and that we know about the Middle East, right? Or not. So I wrote a reportage, a war reportage, a so-called serious reportage about what happened in Kobane. I'm going to write a column about this woman commander I really kind of fell in love with. So you see, I'm really weird because I can write about wars for Vanity Fair, and then I can write about how I feel about them for Mary Claire. So I'm lucky, but this is a point that I'm trying to make about writing a column. You kind of sort of need to figure out where you land. Once you kind of discover, and it's the first discover, and it's pretty important that you know, it's like the first step that you need to make, what is the object of your obsession? Tomatoes, Middle East, stock market, fashion, whatever, then you just need to plunge into it blind and naked. You just need to go and discover and learn, possibly. It is going to be just a long journey, never ending process of discovery. This is about the reporting part. So, Assume you want to be a, a columnist about, I don't know, fashion. I don't know, I can talk about worries. But basically, if you want to be a columnist about politics or about war or about anything that is involved with that, you kind of really need to know what's happening. So you need to know, you know all the kind of um, designers who are hot out there if you're interested in fashion. And you have to know eventually why they're doing what they're doing and where they're coming from. It's tough. And you know why it's tough? Because unless you kind of know where you're coming from, unless you really know why you're obsessed by the things you're obsessed, it'll be very hard for you to find out why people are obsessed about what they're obsessed. In other terms, or in other words, if I kind of wasn't prepared to listen to this woman, the commander, most of my colleagues arrived. Example, good example. I love examples about my colleagues. Um, they arrived, there was this Le Monde guy, very Le Monde guy, okay? Um, he arrived, he, he didn't have a tie because there was mud all over, but he could have, you know, it was the kind of character. And so he started asking all these kind of questions to these people, saying, like, okay, you just, the town was liberated two days earlier, and the place was still completely destroyed, and they're still fighting all over the place, right? So he arrives, and he's asking these people that are amazing human beings, he's asking these people, like, okay, so now, do you have a plan for the reconstruction of Kobane? And I'm like, hello, <laughs> hello, look around. I mean, it's like the, 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 the place is dressed up, it's grozny, and you're asking them whether they have, they just liberated two days ago, and you're asking them today, whether well, it's like, just listen, try to figure out what happened. Try to figure out how they got here. Try to figure out why they got here. So I got really curious about this woman. I saw, I just listened. She was really kind of suspicious of me. And I think it's really important Whatever you want to do, whatever you want to write, whatever you want to focus on, whatever your obsession you decide and establish is going to be, it's very important to listen. Extremely important. People don't know how to listen. This is another class. But listening is crucial, because just by listening, you kind of figure out who you're talking to. So this woman is like, I didn't care about what's going to happen tomorrow. I want to, I want to know what happened yesterday and the day before yesterday and why we're here today telling this amazing story. So it's like, OK, so this is a woman. And she's the commander of the ground troops. And he's a woman. And they, she, they just defeated ISIS. Yes, Uncle Obama, they called him Uncle Obama. I loved it. Uncle Obama was kind of helpful, you know, bombing them, bombing the enemy. But, but Uncle Obama intervened after 45 days that these guys were fighting with Kalashnikovs against tanks and artillery. So what, what does it take for people to resist for 45 days? It's like, I was so intrigued by that, you know, curiosity, obsession. Listen. Try to figure out where the person in front of you comes from. So I was talking to this woman, and, and, and she's like, she's between 40 and 50. 
I didn't ask her age because I, I needed to gain her trust, and I didn't think that asking how old are you was going to establish intimacy. You know, woman, woman, good, bad idea. And, and then she's a woman who spent 20 years up in the mountains. She's a Kurdish woman. She's from Turkey. The Kurds have been kind of slaughtered all over the place in the Middle East. They've been gassed by Saddam. They've been killed by Hafez Assad. They've been, you name it. The Turkish government, you know, kind of bombed places. It's like she was 18 and she went up to the mountains because there was an act, her act of rebellion. Her identity, when she was your age, was defined by the choice of going up to the mountains. Your identity might be defined by picking a, a, a miserable life in, in the art of writing. <laughs> no, I'm joking. But, but it was a defining moment, and I'm very interested in defining moments, because like, guess what, they're universal. So this woman was defined by her choice of going up to the mountains and, and fight, because it was very unjust what everyone was doing to her people. And this is the reason why she spent 20 years fighting, preparing for the mother of all battles in Kobane. It's interesting, right? It's good stuff, right? It's the stuff you want to read in a column and you don't read anywhere else. And I cannot write in a reportage because if something happened, they liberated the city, I need to figure out how they liberated the city. But the more I was listening to this woman, she was telling me the day they kept the city, they held the city. None of my colleagues were interested in this, right? It's like the day they kept the city, there were no aerial bombardment, there was no nothing, they were alone. It was October the 6th. The question I asked her is like, what was the toughest moment? Don't we all have very difficult days? Don't we? It's tough, right? Sometimes it's very tough. It's like, what is the toughest moment? It's like an archetypical question, right? What was the toughest moment in this, in this moment? It's like momentous battle you just had. October the 6th, what happens? Like, we were surrounded. We had only one escape. ISIS was were saying Kobane had fallen. The Turkish media were saying Kobane had fallen. Everybody was calling me walkie-talkie on radio saying what we're supposed to do, we are, we are a gun. And I was telling everybody we will resist until our last fighter is standing and we will resist until our last home is standing. Until we have a house, we will resist. Now I'm getting the goosebumps. If you're getting the goosebumps when you listen about this stuff, this is gonna go to your copy. And this is something I was supposed to tell you later, but hold on. So she's telling me, I'm, t I'm, I'm, I'm telling my fighters, you're going to be there, and you're not going to leave, and we're going to fight un until the last woman and man. And then guess who were the ones on the front lines who were calling her, saying, we're not moving. There was one woman called Destina. Destina. Destiny. Destina. I love it. It's, it's stuff of literature, right? Destina was calling her, a woman, a girl of 22 from Suleimania. was calling her, and she was telling her, Mariam, we're not moving. Don't worry, we're not moving. And so, boom, Mariam t picks up the Kalashnikov and goes to the front line. And something that I discovered is beautiful. Now, I could write a second column. It was beautiful. The women in the Middle East, not only the Kurdish women, have this thing that's called tilili. The tilili is the ululating thing that you hear. You might have heard it somewhere if you follow the news a little bit. But it's like women in the Middle East or in the Muslim world, they do this ululation thing. They tried to teach me, it was, I was useless. They do this thing at, at weddings, you know, at parties when they're happy, and it's also the cry of battle. It's like they scream it. The Kurdish fighters, when they're on the front line, it's getting really hard. They're just are screaming like mad women. And guess what? ISIS fighters, the black men, they're really scared about women on the front lines. And there is, I, I find out, I, I have no idea. They're really scared about the Tlili because they think that if they get killed by a woman, they're not going to go to paradise. And they're not going to get the milk and the honey and the 72 virgins. So the bottom line of, of the column, and I'm right, is like that Kobane was saved on October the 6th by ululating women who basically were telling the fighters on the other side that you, they're not going to go to paradise. That's beautiful, right? I loved it. And the reason why I loved it was because it tells you a little bit about what happened in a very human way. It's a human story everyone can relate to. It's a story, it's an epic story of resistance and rebellion and dignity that talks to our hearts. Of course, none of my colleagues got that because they weren't listening. Why they weren't listening? 
because they didn't do what I'm gonna recommend you and what's the first rule that I think is very important for anyone who wants to be, I think anything, but especially if you wanna be a writer or a journalist and kind of figure out what your, your universe is and then write about it. The first thing you wanna do, and it's really important, is to ask yourself whether, <laughs> and this is gonna sound funny, whether you had an unhappy childhood. If you had an unhappy childhood, that's good. <laughs> an unhappy childhood, as Hemingway would say, is excellent if you want to write. You know why? Because it pushes you to places happy people would not go to. And only going to these very dark places, you kind of figure out things that a lot of people don't figure out. So unless you want to write crap that adds up to the global crap that is all over the web, get a shrink. And this is my first piece of advice. Get a shrink if you have an unhappy childhood and you cannot be deterred and you really want to write and you really want to perfect the, act, the, 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 the art of writing and eventually become a person with an identity able to listen and to sympathize with people then you really need to figure out who you are. There is no other way. You want to write a column? Okay, do you know who you are? Do you know why you do the things you do? Do you know why you like the color purple, for example? Or the number three? Or guys with a beard? Or going to a soccer game? Do you know these things? Find out, I think. It's very important. Unless you kind of manage to analyze your life and understand where you come from, you know, there is no point in writing. Because unless you kind of know why you do the things you do, you're not going to know why the people in front of you, you're not going to wonder why the people in front of you do the things they do. Am I making any sense here? Like, Emotions are universal. Now, if you're writing about tomatoes, I don't think you need a lot of emotions, but you, you do need to know how to write, and that involves a lot, you know, pain anyway, because unless you kind of figure out, you know, why you're doing this, it's like, unless you analyze your obsession, it's, it's not going to be sustained. So forget about the tomatoes. But if you want to write the kind of column that I write, which is for a woman magazine, and, and it's very important to know your audience, so I'm writing for a woman magazine, for a women magazine, and the, the, the readers that read Mary Claire um, are middle class, educated women, who maybe go to the hairdresser and read the column, or maybe they're subscribed because they get the adventure they don't get in their lives. They don't, they don't get by going to school, maybe middle school, maybe. So they're looking for some wisdom and knowledge and adventure and, and, and you know, they, you will sustain their attention only by telling them things that they can, they, that they can identify with. And what is it, something that you can identify with? Something that makes you think. Something that adds up to whatever you know. Something that kind of turns on a light on whatever it is. And can be cooking a soup or it can be like a woman commander and getting why this woman is fighting in Kobane. So why I'm telling you these things? And, and it's like, it's obvious, I think, right? It's pretty obvious. And it's like, if you want to write, you wanna, you wanna, you're ambitious. Writing is a cool career, right? It's, a, it's very cool, so you're ambitious. Ambitious is good, but it needs to be sustained. I remember when I was 25, there was this editor-in-chief of Corriere della Sera, which is the Italy's leading newspaper. And I was just kind of this raw energy. I was escaping all the time. I don't know where the hell I was going, but I was just pure raw energy. I was doing, doing stuff. I didn't know why, and I had no clue. I was blind, but I was just, my energy sustained me. And look at me, and it's like, you know, he said it in Italian. He said, you're velletaria. Velletaria, it was like he was stabbing me in the back. It's like, you, you, you are unrealistic. Fanciful. He was telling me, what are you talking about? It's like, you want to be Hemingway at 25 and you haven't read like 1,000 books and you don't know the world and you can't, can you describe an atmosphere, a sound, an emotion? I thought he was, an, uh, he, he was a bad person. I can say that. So I thought he was a bad person. Uh, yeah. I, I thought he was a bad person, but in fact, what he was trying to tell me was, 
get a life. Right? He, he was telling me, it was, okay, the moment, the, the, the moment you're actually going to do something that matches your ambition, to put in the work, the, the amount of work that needs to be put in, um, you know, I, I, I don't want to waste my time with you. And he was right. I, I really didn't know what I was doing. So um, at a certain point I did, though. And it took some time. And I think because you all want to be columnists, and you cannot be deterred, apparently, um, I probably, I'm going to tell you how I got there, probably. Um, because a, a writing a column, right, I cannot teach you how to write a column. It's impossible. It's like asking a painter how, how he paint. You know, it's like, it's one of those things that I can't tell you. But I can tell you how you get to have an eye and an ear. I can tell you that talent is basically the form that you choose to express your sensitivity. But sensitivity is something that, you, that is only yours. I can't tell you, you know, how to observe things. That's only yours. I can tell you how I did and how I got there, which might be of interest, maybe. Um, how I got there, and I did not want to be a columnist, but I wanted to be a writer. I knew that I wanted to write. I knew that I wanted to travel. I was blind, I was stupid, I was ignorant, unaware, the whole package, but I knew what I wanted. I knew, I mean, so the one thing that I think helped was I was, you know, fairly traumatized. Fair, I had a fam was like unhappy childhood and a dysfunctional family, so I had the fundamentals. <laughs> and, then, and then after that, I had all this anxiety and energy. There was this power, this tremendous drive, and I also knew that I was interested in serious stuff and adventure and travel and writing. So I thought adventure, writing, journalism, traveling, woo, foreign correspondent. So I thought I had to do what a lot of people do, which is get a fancy education, which I did. I went to study at Columbia University. I got the master's at Columbia. And then I came back and I got a job in a newsroom. I lasted 18 months. It was hell. It was hell. I hated, I hated with a vengeance. I could I just like, those 18 months, but you have to do it, and you have to go through the motions, and you need to find out. And not, nothing, no knowledge, no one can tell you anything. Everything you have to find out for your own. Unless you find out on your own, it's nothing. It's not something that you own. It's not something you're going to be able to think about, know to share, know to communicate effectively. You need to get there. It's, you know, it's like how many millions, 150,000 years of humanity? No, you need to get there on your own. No one can tell you, no one can teach you. You just need to get there on your own. So what I did was I came back, I realized that the newsroom was really bad for me, personally. Horrible. Hated it. They put me in front of a computer. I was kind of reading uh, the AP and France Press all day, and then they wanted me kind of figure out a way to make sense of this. Hated it. 18 months later, I was out of there. Everybody told me that I was crazy. You need to be crazy also. If you want to be a writer and a columnist, a little bit crazy is good. We're all crazy, but you need to find out how crazy you are. Crazy is good also. It means you're different. Um, and everybody told me I was crazy. I quit. I said, no, I can't do this. Like, what do you mean? It's so tough to get a job in journalism in Italy. They hired you. It's a big company. It's La Repubblica, Espresso. Two years, you're going to be at uh, the foreign desk. It's like, yeah, for two years, I'll be on the foreign desk. I'm going to be rotting here for the next 20 years, kind of reading the copy of these assholes <laughs> who are old and pretend to go to where the action is. And in fact, the older colleagues, they just hang out in five-star hotels and they kind of rewrite the same agencies, the same wire that I'm reading in Rome. No, thank you very much. I quit. That was a gamble. That was a serious gamble because um, I had, I'm not, my, so my father is not a millionaire, so I had no really a source of income. It was a real gamble. It was like, oh, oh my God, I'm plunging into the unknown because I'm obsessed and I really want to travel and be a foreign correspondent and I don't want to run for the next 20 years in a newsroom. So if you want to really live your dream, you know, provided you can't be deterred and you have a dysfunctional family and all of that, if you really want to do that, at a certain point you need to take a risk. You need to plunge, you need to gamble, you need to kind of bet throw the dice and bet that you can actually do this and you will be sustained by your passion. And eventually compassion will come, but it's the passion that drives you at the beginning. So 
I moved to the Middle East. I moved to the Middle East because 9-11 had happened. We all need to define, I said this at the beginning, right? We all need somehow to define what is it that we are obsessed by. Tomatoes, fashion, uh, whatever, right? So my obsession was I wanted to be big and I wanted to be important and da -da -da, all things I couldn't really sustain. So yes, Middle East, 9-11, the Arabs, I'll study Arabic, try to figure out what these guys are. And a voice of me was like, you don't have any money. It's like, yeah, but I'll be freelancing. The Americans are embarking on a couple of wars and plenty of work. And in fact, this is exactly what happened. So you need to be able to gamble. Even if you're blind and naked and raw energy, you don't really know what you're doing. A side of you actually knows. So, bang. I was first in Cairo and then Beirut. Raw energy, just, that was my universe. That was the object of my obsession. Could be anything again. I picked the Middle East. I thought it was important, I thought, I thought it was interesting. I thought that because I had no money and I was a freelancer, people would call me and in fact they did. And so I just landed in this universe that was, frankly, very weird. It was so strange. Beirut, how can I tell you? Um, <laughs> my, um, my postman, I can tell you about my postman. I was completely blind, like, but if you choose your universe, then things happen to you, okay? And then eventually you notice things. Like I was blind, but still kind of, History and the stories were literally knocking on my door. I was living on the seventh floor and the postman was this guy and he was really cute. And at the beginning, because I was blind and not really paying attention to people, because this is what we all do, right? We don't listen, we do not, don't pay attention to people. I was not seeing anyone. But anyway, this postman was kind of cute. And I noticed that he wasn't kind of leaving my, my mail. We had mail still in Beirut back in, in 2003, 2004. He would actually get the elevator and come to the seventh floor to deliver the mail and knock on my door and give me my mail. And it's like, ah, oh. the first time I didn't notice. The second time I kind of pretend I didn't. The third time, the guy, very cute, he handed me this piece of paper. And it's like, it was nine in the morning, I was half asleep. Also, you can be a journalist and economist if you're sleeping late in your 20s, it's okay. <laughs> so I was like, oh, yawn. What the, it was like, Pfft. open the door and the postman is there. It's like, huh. And he hands me a letter, and I'm like, shukran. And then he hands me another piece of paper, and it is a phone number. It's like, huh. And I'm like, yeah, it's my cell phone. Huh, in case you want a coffee, take a talk. We will go out for a coffee one day. Coffee? I didn't really know what to tell him, and so I asked his name. And he's like, what's your name? Ali Mornier. I woke up immediately. It's like, Mornier? And he's like, yeah, Mournier. And I'm like, Mournier, Mournier? I was completely awake. He's like, yeah. Like, Imad Mournier? He's like, my cousin. He's like, ah! Oh. So, <laughs> so you, he's like, Imad Mournier. Of course you don't know because you're in Florence and you're from New York. He's like, but Imad Mournier was the head of special operations. He's like the terrorist in chief of Hezbollah. And he was on the top list of the FBI. The Mossad wanted him dead. Eventually, the Mossad got him and killed him and blew up in Damascus three years later. And one of the first things that you learn if you want to be foreign correspondent in Beirut is that there is this dude called Imad Mugnia that changed his face we don't know how many times because he's there plotting these horrible things and changing his faces because he doesn't want to be recognized and he wants to travel across the border. And all in a sudden, my postman at 9 a.m. one morning tells me that he's the cousin of Imad Mognier. So I, I, I didn't know who I was, but I knew who the postman was. And so I grabbed the coat and said, we're going to have a coffee now. <laughs> and so at that time, there was the reporter inside of me who was basically, you know, this raw kind of human being who was ready and excited and passionate. So I wrote a story about my postman, but I couldn't write a column back then about my postman, why I, why I could write a story, a news story, but not a column. I couldn't write a column because a column, again, I'll go back, but it's an important point, because at, at that point, I couldn't really see him. I, I was not really, I mean, I was only interested in his cousin, which is newsworthy, right? It's like when my colleague, Le Monde people, doing Kobane, 
give me the news. But I, actually, you get the news and you get the stories when you actually listen to people. I should have asked him so many questions about his family and how he grew up and how come that this kid ends up being my postman and delivering the stuff to a foreigner, Hezbollah, you know, Hezbollah, Terrorist Inc. And the postman instead, you know, pays attention and takes the elevator and gets to the seventh floor to give me a mail and then my mail and then ask me out for a coffee. How come the cousin changes face and is running and eventually the Mossad blew him up in Damascus and this kid is here hanging out and just want to have a coffee with the national Bea, with the foreigner. That was the column, right? I didn't have it. I was not able to listen. I, was, I didn't know how to listen. I didn't know what the story was. I didn't know what I had to look for. I was, I was an average. I was a good reporter in terms of the news, but I was, it's like in terms of, of a writer, I wasn't getting the real stuff because I wasn't asking the questions. Another thing that I was doing, and we all do that, and it's part of the process, and then if you're obsessed and you get a shrink, you'll get there. But um, I was basically imitating, in terms of writing, what other people were doing. So I thought that there were some very cool people writing some really good copy, and I read them religiously all the time. I really read them stuff. And then what I tried to do was kind of trying to figure out what they were doing, and then trying to do whatever they were doing. So sometime I would write something that looked like what this guy had written, and some other time I was writing something else. There was something, you know, that looked like this other guy the copy this other guy had written, but I wasn't really kind of consistent. I didn't have my own voice. Why didn't I have my own voice? I didn't have my own I. I didn't have my own identity. Unless you develop your own sensitivity and your I, you won't see things. You won't be able to get to the catacombs. And it takes time and patience, and you need to be very humble, and you need to be very respectful, and people need to trust you, and you need to hang out long enough and drink a lot of coffee or tea, depending on what part of the planet, the planet you're hanging out. It's like if you're in India, you drink the chai, and if you're in the Middle East, you get kind of crazy because you drink 15 coffees every day. And, 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 but that's what it takes. You might get a gastritis, but you're going to get a very good rider, I promise. Am I making sense here? I, I, I think. I think this that I'm telling you, it's kind of a process that everybody went through. So I, I, was a, I think I was a good journalist in terms of the news, but I was an average writer. And forget about getting a column. It, just, it wasn't just happening. I actually tried to write one about the postman. It was crap. It was very bad. It was like, as I, 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 I read that thing. And I, and, I, and I was like, I can't do this, you know. So how? How did I get the column, which we're all interested in? Well, I got the shrink. <laughs> it's true. It's true. And I didn't get the shrink because things were blowing up in Beirut. Things were really blowing up in Beirut. It's like it's not just the postman who's a nice guy and asked me out for coffee. Things were literally blowing up in Beirut. Beirut is, was, was this place where everything happened. It's like in Beirut, you could find the fanciest clubs and discos of the Middle East where the princes of Saudi Arabia came and hang out. And Beirut is the kind of place where you go to a club and they have this gigantic bottle of champagne and there is on a, on a, on a wall, they actually write, it's that cheesy, they actually write the amount of money that, the, this is like the most money that the client spends. So the one who's spending more money, they put this name on a wall. It's the kind of traumatized, fascinating, weird place that Beirut is. So things were blowing up. I was living in Hamra. That was also an interesting choice. All my, co all my colleagues were living in Ashrafia, Christian neighborhood. I'm like, what am I? So it's like there were bells all the time, churches all the time. I was like, I'm a Christian. I'm, 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 I was like, I'm from, I live in Rome. Don't give me a church on a Sunday. It's like I'm at home. No, I can't live in Ashrafia. I wanna I'm in the Middle East. I want to live in the Muslim neighborhood, right? I'm in the Middle East. I'm in the so-called Arab world. I moved to the Middle East, and to, the, to, the, to Hamra, to the Muslim neighborhood. It was insane. I mean, Ramadan, I was surrounded by three mosques, because it, like, it was like, during Ramadan, it was like really having the Saturday night fever on a disco, because the praying was like, 
things were blowing up, I would be on a terrace and like bang, and then I'd get a flip flop. So I was that stupid. I would get my flip flop on, go down, just walk five minutes, and like, oh, somebody got blown up in front of my favorite cafe. Cafe Rada, who's that guy? It's like fireman mess. It's like, oh, that's really bad. It's like, it was this process of discovery, and I didn't have the real words for it. It was really, it was really kind of frustrating. And then at a certain point, I didn't go to the shrink because things were blowing up in Beirut. Because you're, if you're dysfunctional, you end up to the shrink because you're dating the wrong guy or the wrong girl. So I was dating the wrong guy, and I was like, I need to get rid of this guy, and I don't really know how to get rid of this guy shrink. So I was this weirdo Italian woman who would be okay with things blowing up literally five minutes from my place. Let's copy. You know, I'm a, I was, at that point, you know, I was a freelancer, I was a successful freelancer, I was writing for a daily newspaper, I was writing for a magazine, television was calling me, I hated television, but anyway. So at that point, I'm like, I'm really unhappy and I don't know how to leave this guy and I need to do something about this and what do I do about this? And I asked the colleague, who asked another colleague, who asked another colleague, and then I'm the Italian woman who ends up doing therapy in English with a Christian shrink in Ashrafia. It was great. The best thing I ever done. Really, completely surreal. I started crying on the shrink of my on the couch of my Lebanese shrink in Ashrafi about my fa grandfather dying. It was terrible. I was crying like a mad woman about the death of my grandfather, which had happened when I was 10. Who knew that I was so desperate about my grandfather's death? I mean, it's like, it's like what happens when you go to a shrink is like, you cry for all the tears. All the tears that you never cried, they came out. And they need to come out eventually. Because, you know, a trauma, is the way you basically get back in touch with your emotions. If you've been traumatized, it means you shut down. I don't know one single foreign correspondent or photojournalist who's not heavily traumatized. In fact, I don't think I know one single photojournalist who's not an orphan. It's like the real good ones, they all lost their dads or their mothers or they were when they're 10, 12, 13, and then they, you know what, you know why I'm telling you this? I'm not telling you this to be weird. I'm telling you this is because what loss does to you is basically to teach you, to give you a sense of perspective. It basically teaches you the fact that in the long term, in the long run, we're all dead. So we might as well enjoy it, and we might as well do what, what it is that we really care and what we really like. So what I really cared and what I really liked, and what I really wanted to do, and I didn't know how, was to get rid of my boyfriend. <laughs> and, and in the process, once I, once I started going to the shrink, you know, I started really understanding so many things. It's like, why I like the color purple? My grandfather loved the color purple, but I had no idea. Why my favorite number is three? I've got three brothers, and this is a different lecture and a different conference. And why I ended up with, I like barbudos, you know, men that have a beard. Because my father, in fact, when I was five, would hold me in his lap and go like this, and he had a beard, and I really loved that. And so if I'm man has a beard right now, I really like it. And this is all stuff that is not good for a war reporter, but it made me a columnist. It made, it, it, because all in a sudden, I kind of knew where I was coming from. And you see, one thing about human beings, as I said at the beginning, emotions are universal. Emotions are universal. So if you start to decipher your own emotions, if you start to realize why you're feeling the way you're feeling, if there is a kind of a third eye in the back of your head that looks from a distance at you and other people around you and starts kind of taking into account different perspective and different kinds of seeing things, then you can write about them and it's wonderful. Now you understand why you need to get there if you want to be a writer. You really need to kind of figure out what other people are thinking. But unless you really know why you're thinking what you're thinking, it's not happening, right? So it was great. <laughs> I got rid of the boyfriend. 
it took me like six good months of therapy to get rid of the boyfriend. It was victory. And, but one, also, one, one other thing that is very important, and I can't stress enough, very, very important. You see, you can't, if you want to just be a journalist, you don't need to do this. But if you want to be really good at what you do, you need to read a tremendous amount. A tremendous amount. You know, you just need to read. And so while I was in the process, as I thought I was just getting rid of the, act, of, the of the boyfriend, who by the way, who by the way was older and, and, and more established, and he was still in my staff all the time, and he could write, and I got so pissed, and it's one of the reasons why I left him. It's like oh, this is really bad. <laughs> I should be able to write my own copy. But anyway, so one of the things that was great that happened was I was basically living the life of a nun in, in Beirut. I was seeing the shrink and reading and doing yoga and exercising and then writing a novel that I would never publish because it would be too embarrassing and too personal, intimate, I'll never do that. But I did this for six months. I was writing and reading, sort of growing up, crying for my grandfathers or whatever tears needed to be shed. And then something, because I really do believe that you cannot, if you perfect your craft and you're there, and, 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 and your obsession is your fuel, it's what fuels you and powers you, and you're there and you're doing it and doing it and doing it again, over and over and over things happen. It took me 10 years, it took me 10 years to really become the person that I wanted to become when I graduated from Columbia University. This is the amount of time that you, if you really get it right, it takes. And so it seems like a fairy tale, but what happened was six months later, got rid of the boyfriend, war happened. The Israelis invaded Lebanon, the south. And all sorts of magazines started calling because I was the crazy Italian woman living in Beirut. I'd been there exploring my turf, getting to know the people, establishing contacts, doing things to understand the place, having a knowledge that other people didn't have. People parachuted, didn't know as much as I did. But I also had something. I had these six months of seclusion spent in reading and writing that actually prepared me for that fateful phone call. I can never remember, I can never forget. I was in a park downstairs. The park was just a, play, a nice place where kids would go playing. All in a sudden, the park was a refugee camp with all the people fleeing war. And I got that phone call, the phone call. Yeah, right? We all dream for the phone call. And it's the editor in chief of Vanity Fair. And he's asking me, well, he says something that's funny. He says, like, now, hi, Ima, you might think that I'm calling you because there is a war in Lebanon. It's like, ha, ha, ha. It's like, what, you're pretending you're calling me because there is a war in Lebanon, but anyway. So, so he asked me to write a story, and I did. And that first story was written, I wrote it in a way I'd never written before. It was just different. All in a sudden, I had the voice. And people actually, it became really nice because in, like in a few weeks, when that voice was sustained, people would call me and tell me that you know, they knew that it was me even without looking at the byline. So how did I get that? But for example, the story that I wrote that got me the column, and I can share you, I can't teach you how to write a column, but I can tell you how I got there, right? This is what I'm trying to do. So what I, the, the way I wrote one day a story, we are in southern Lebanon, and the Israelis are bombing, and we are kind of locked up in a little area in the port of the port of Tyre. You know, and some of it was bombed as well. And we as the the hack pack, right? And and all in a sudden, and we can see the planes and we can hear the drones. And I was so it was so frustrating because you didn't know where to go to. And all in a sudden I was thinking, Jesus, you know, the guy, the pilot up there on that plane. He, he must be a kid. He must be 10, 20, 22. He's young as, you know, he's, 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 he's young and he has to make decisions on life and death. And so I was there and I was like, I really hope he had good dreams. I really hope he, his girlfriend is really nice and had a nice conversation with the girlfriend because I really need him to be in a good mood, you know? And that was what everybody was thinking. And so rather than starting a story by kind of telling you that that day um, 46 people were killed in a bombardment of Kana, 
which it's exactly what happened, I kind of started the story by kind of rambling about the pilot and, and, and describing, you need to describe places, sensations, and emotions, and people can identify with those emotions and feelings. So I was there, and I described a bit the fishermen. They were all drunk. They were Christian. The reason why we were there holed up in the port, at the port was, was a Christian. They were, the Christians were all drunk. Some of them were, were going fishing with explosives. They were kind of using dynamite to fish. It was horrible. And we're there, and we don't know. We can't get out of our little ghetto because of this pilot who, whose mood we were here trying to figure out. You know, is he happy? That's when I got the phone call, and they asked me to write a column. All in a sudden, I was able to see things with my own eyes. All in a sudden, I wasn't doing what everybody was doing. It took, it took some pain. And, um, and, and it, I mean, it doesn't really get easier. I mean, it does if you kind of, it does in the sense that you get the experience and know what it works and what it doesn't. So it does because you kind of know what you're looking for. One of the things that I discovered that really works when I have to write a column or in general, is to sit down and trying to figure out when was the moment that I got the goosebumps. I really make a point of sitting down and closing my eyes and closing, and closing my notebook. And I go through with my mind, again, whatever experience I had in reporting. Taking notes is really important. You should take notes every day and write every day and read every day. Taking notes is so important because you forget. We forget. Details, we forget them. So take notes all the time. Take a, it's like a notebook in your bag all the time. Try to describe as accurately as possible. So I was there and I'm like, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God. How do I do this? I need some rules. I need some guidelines. And then I realized I always get goosebumps. It's like I got goosebumps telling you about the epic fight and the Lili in Kobane. A column has to start from the Tilili in Kobane because when they told me, when the women told me, I was like <laughs> shivering. And so if I find the words to describe that moment, chances are you're going to be shivering too. So this is one of the things that was precious that I learned. Other than that, it's just a lot of kind of writing and writing and rewriting. Once I have the first draft, I have, I don't know, I'm happy once I have to, the first draft because that means that I can torture myself for 30, 40, 50 more times and trying to kind of figure out what works. That's where the language comes in, right? It's like you know what you want to express, you know what you want to say, but there's always this tremendous gap between what you want to say and what actually you're able to say what actually you're, go you're able to transform into words. And that's a struggle. And that struggle is never going to end for anyone. It's like even the biggest ones, even the monsters of literature, that's always a struggle. Unless you're struggling, you're going to produce crap like everybody else. And I don't recommend you. And, and you, you know, I recommend you to do something different because it would be easier and, 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 and you won't agonize over, over a blank page. Um, and I've got a few more minutes. One last thing I think that is very important is characters. I kind of focused enough on, on the universe, on, on, on the obsession, on a place, on a desert whose little piece of sand, little grain you want to describe. But it's like a little column it can be a little grain that you can describe, a little universe, a little microcosm that you can describe and kind of tells your whole picture, right? And kind of gives you an intuition of what's happening. And people are very, very important, unless you're writing for a food uh, magazine. Um, people are very important. But chef, food magazines are all about the chefs. You gotta get the chef, so I take that back. But people are very important. So whenever I'm out there, and I go all over the place, and probably the only, I don't know whether it's a world country where I haven't been, but um, missing North Korea, but I've been around. I've been around, and I can tell you, the, the first thing that I ask, my fixer, or the fixer is the local journalist who's helping you with contacts or security. The first one question that I ask all the time is, I need characters. 
because you need storytelling, and storytelling is made out of characters, and characters are what are going to make alive your story. So you really need characters. And I'll give you one last example. I, I fell in love with so many characters, um, but one guy I really liked, because not only you need characters in a column or in anything you write, but they also you need some tension, some evolution, some transition. You need a departing point, and then things happen, and they take you somewhere. You know? And you need to be able to capture this evolution. You need kind of to figure out where this person started and where he landed. And so I'm in Benghazi, and it's last year. And I'm working on the immigration story that um, I talked about last time I was here. And it's a war zone. It's Libya. Um, they move me around in different houses for security reasons. Um, they basically, some of these houses, I had no idea who the owners were. I end up in this house, and the owner, or whatever, the guy who was living there, was this. Sudanese guy named Abdul. Now, I'm totally into this immigration thing, and Abdul is my host for one night or two, and, 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 and I'm totally kind of trying to figure out my story. And I make the mistake of not interacting with Abdul because he speaks Arabic, Sudanese, and it's a nightmare, and I'm tired, and so I should have put in the extra effort that I eventually did, but at the beginning, I didn't. And then one morning, one of the things I also do all the time I write my dreams, because if you get to the shrink, and you need to go to the shrink if you want to be a writer, you write your dreams. And don't tell me it's expensive to go to the shrink, because then you sell your dreams and take the money back, OK? So go to the shrink and, sell your dream, and write your dreams in the morning. So get a notebook next to your bed, and every morning, when you get up, write your dreams. So that morning, as unlikely as it might seem, because I always travel with my green notebook where I write my dreams, I was there, and Ansari Sharia was bombing somewhere, and I was like, oh my god, da da da. And I was trying to decipher my dream, I was writing the dream, I'm there. And Abdu comes. And he's like, what are you doing? I'm like, I'm writing my dream completely kind of out of this world, okay? I'm in this house near the front line. I, I don't know this guy, he's a Sudanese, all I know, and I'm writing a, a, a dream. It's like the total Westerner, and he's like in the middle of a war zone, completely crazy. He's like, you're writing a dream? Iowa, I'm writing a dream. So he sits there squarely, and he's like, my name is Abdu. And he goes on a conference. He's like, my name is Abdu. I know. I'm from Fasher. Fasher is one of the places in Darfur where a lot of bad things are happening. He's like, OK. You know, last week, 16 villages were burned in Darfur. Answer people were killed, and no one is talking about in Darfur. And you're writing your dreams? Um, <clears throat> you know, my brother, he was the president of Darfur. Omar Bashir, the president in Khartoum, the Sudanese president, killed him. This is the reason why I'm here. They killed my brother. You know? Yeah. They used to call me Abdu Fox. This was my name, Abdu Fox. Huh. Why? I was really good in the war, uh, warring in deserts. Like I was a warrior in the desert. They called me Abdu Fox, you know. OK. You know how they call me now? It's like, no. Abdu DJ. I like that. Abdu DJ? Yeah. Abdu DJ. Yeah. You know what I did? He said, no. I took a boat. I went to Italy. I said, I don't want it, all of this. War all over, I war in Darfur, they killed my brother, I come to Libya, there is war. I took a boat to Italy. Yeah, Italy, Italia, Fakira, he said. Italy is a poor country. He's like, <laughs> what, what can I tell you? <laughs> <laughs> Italy is a poor country. Yeah, they put me in a center for six months, but I needed to make money. I have a family to support, my old mother in fashion. So, I came back. I asked the UN to come back. You came back to Benghazi? Yeah, from Torino. They put me on a plane. I come back to Benghazi. Huh. So now I'm organizing weddings. <laughs> and I'm like, you're organizing weddings? Yeah, people get married, you know, even in war times. People get married and they need good DJs, you know? And I'm a DJ. <laughs> it was a great column. I loved it.
I loved it. I'm the fox, I'm the DJ. Thank you very much. It was one hour. Okay. Did anything else happen in your unhappy childhood? I'm not gonna, sorry. I'm not gonna. Uh, okay, yeah. <laughs> Well, did they ask me a more specific question? I don't want to get too specific. Never mind. I'll pass Anything it on. Anything that made me the person I am, you mean? Yeah. OK. Um, basic, I can, I can share that. I have no problem. I cried enough tears for a long time, and I stopped, and I'm happy. I was like, I'm peace. It's what I was talking, when I was talking about loss, and the fact that you can recognize loss and talk about loss only when, when you experience loss. And when I was 15, I lost someone that was really dear to me. And that kind of changed everything, but I didn't know back then because what you do when you're confronted by loss is kind of denying it. And what you do normally is you shut down and, and you just become this anxious person who doesn't know why um, you're anxious. And so this is eventually why I ended up 20 years later on a couch in Beirut. But I think this is what I, I, I try to make it sound funny because it can be funny, but. But I think people, I think trauma in a sense allows you to explore who you are. And a certain amount of neurosis is what sustains an obsession. Now you need to be healthy. This is why hence the shrink. And, and, and um, I, I truly believe that an analyzed life is not worth living for everybody. I think you really need to know why you like the color purple. If you really want to have a meaningful existence. And, and, and I think, you know, we only have one. And I don't know, you could be a Buddhist or a Christian, whatever. I believe we have one. And so we might as well kind of know what it is and what it means. I think I'm after meanings. And, and so that trauma allowed me to become the person who's talking to you today. Thank you. Um, you talked about getting to know sort of the people, like having a coffee or tea, for example, with the people that you were going to interview for your column. So did you ever find like that they were sort of concerned with how they wanted to be perceived in your column? Like were they invested in what you were going to write about them in a certain way? Or did that conversation just never really reach the table? No, people are not concerned about the way you're going to portray them. And they don't talk to you in general unless they trust you. I mean, the number one rule in general, unless people trust you, and unless you gain the confidence and the trust of people, they're not going to talk to you. And they talk to you when they trust you. So once they trust you, they don't worry about what you're going to write because they trusted you. The woman in Kobane, the commander, she trusted me. And I think I, I'm quite confident. I did not see anything else. I think I'm the only woman who talked to her in Kobane. I'm, I'm the only person, I'm the only reporter she actually talked to. And the reason why she did was because when I went to see her, she was really cautious, and I could see her. I could see that she was really cautious. We were together for a couple of hours, and for the first hour, I didn't take one single note. My notebook stayed in my bag because I understood that she was studying me and evaluating me. So there was no point in asking her anything because what, what, what I'm going to do if she, you know, if you don't have the trust of a person, I'm not going to get anything of value. So after one hour, and the photographer was an Italian guy, and he was saying he was talking to me in Italian. He was like, "Why don't you start asking questions? Like, shut up, you stupid!" And he's like, Shh, "Don't you understand what's going on?" And what was going on was that she was kind of trying to figure out whether she could trust me. And after an hour, I actually asked her politely whether I could pick up, take my notebook out and take notes, and she said yes. The morning after, and this is a little, this is about more, rather than, it's, like it's not about the columnist, but it's about actually the reporter. I came back very, I was very happy in Kobane because I found out that there was one Italian guy fighting with the Kurdish resistance in the front line against ISIS. And we found out like as soon as we got there because the photographer knew them, had good relations with the Kurds. But they did it, it's like, but, but, the photographer was not alone. He was with me, and we were a team. So I knew that the woman in charge of making a decision on whether we could interview the, the Italian guy, and no one in Italy has ever interviewed an Italian guy fighting in Syria. Okay, So this is pretty big for Italy. So I knew that the woman was, go was going to make a decision 
about Weta, we would, were going to be able to talk to this guy, was Mariam, was this woman. So after that, after spending the first hour not taking notes and then asking her whether I could take notes, the morning after the permission came, she handed over the Italian fighter. Unfortunately, it was on the front line. It wasn't pretty, but this is a different story. But I think I answered your question. Okay, so when you were talking, you kept saying, um, use it for your copy. What did you mean by your copy? Is that like your own personal story? Everything is copy, as uh, what's her name? Harry Mitali woman used to say. Everything is copy. Everything in life, if you can look at it with your own eye, it's, it can be copied. Tonight could be a copy. I don't know. E everything. There are things that talk to imagine it, your imagination. There are things that inspire you. You have to find out what these things are inspiring to you. What, in what environment you're inspired, right? It's like, what, is it? what kind of environment is inspiring you? What kind of character is inspiring you? What is a line that inspires you? What is, there are so many things. We are bombarded every day by things that we think about and we do remember and we do carry with us and we do not pay attention to. But if you start kind of paying attention to the things that make you shiver, to the things that you think, our brain never stops. Produces a tremendous amount of stuff. Some of it, a lot of it is useless, but a lot of a lot of it is really good. So if you start paying attention to your reaction to the environment you live in, if you start paying attention what something pissed you off or what why something really kind of made you feel like a little girl, like when you were four, for example. So if you start paying attention to all these things, that's copy because it resonates, because you recognize it. And if you recognize it, most likely I will recognize it. That's copy. Uh, you said you have to get people to trust you. Do you, do you. Did you find that you had to like put yourself through some sort of training to get to know how to connect to people? No, it comes natural um, by now. I mean, um, no, when, I mean, it's like there is, Ima before the shrink and Ima after the shrink, right? Now my sister says, my sister, who by the way is a shrink, she says, she says, <laughs> my sister, my sister is like tremendous admiration for my sister. My, my sister says that I was born in Matera and reborn in Beirut. And she's got a point. I think once you start to see people, when you really start listening to people, when you really are curious about people, that comes not, it's, like it's, it's a natural thing. You, you, there is no training. It just comes not as like, I'm really curious. Curiosity really helps. But then why would you want to be a reporter or a columnist or whatever if you're not curious, right? So that's, an, that's the ABC. That's the bottom line. So it just comes natural. You know, I, no, there is no training. It's just you understand. You can see who you're dealing with. You can see the person in front of you. And then, and then you act accordingly. If, if somebody need, you know, is kind of cautious, you understand that this person needs to be reassured that you're not a bad person, that you're actually, you know, a good person. That, and, and a good person in this kind of relations means respectful. People really react to whether you respect them or not. And I think respect is so important. This is why at the beginning I think I, talk, I talked about being humble. It's so important to be humble, you know? There are so many things that you can always learn from people if people open up. And people open up whether they can trust you, whether they decide they can trust you. Thanks so much for sharing earlier. Um, you mentioned, you know, nowadays there's a lot of crap on the internet and a lot of it's available for free. Just wondering um, in, you know, your last 10, 15 years of experience, has the rise of the internet and how easily free news is accessible um, and different stories made it more difficult or easy for you to do the work that you do and get paid for it? Actually, I think what I'm sharing with you is rather compelling because I'm the exception to whatever it happened. I mean, I'm, I'm the demonstration that quality still sells. I mean, none of my stories are available online for free. You have to pay. And then you get all sorts of other stuff for free on the website. And then you get them for free eventually, after a while, OK? But not when they're in the magazine. After a while, you get them up there. But, but, but I'm an exception. And a lot of it has changed. 
and a lot of my colleagues struggle. But can I tell you something? Mm -hmm. The colleagues that really struggle, they, did, <laughs> they really didn't get there. What I'm trying to say is like, if you, if you really kind of perfect your craft, if you really have a different way of telling things, if you really kind of find the way you can tell a story, it's about the storytelling. People will pay for it. Mm. And I, I'm, I'm a true believer in that. Now, I might be out of business in a year or so, I don't know. <laughs> but I'm a true believer. If you're really good, people will pay. It's, it's always like that. What's your favorite thing to read? Kapuscinski. But I'm omnivorous, I read everything. Kapuscinski, I told you in class, don't you remember? <laughs> no, but I read, okay, you wanna know what I read? Yeah. Okay, I read, I read the classics. I read the classics. As Hemingway said, and I'm gonna have it in class tomorrow, it's, I found this interview on Enquire in 1935, I thought it was great, and I shared it. But as Hemingway say, don't, leave, don't read living writers. I wait for them that they're dead and recognized so you don't waste your time. <laughs> Which I thought was great. But no, seriously, um, a guy that I really loved, there are some uh, uh, alive writers that are actually pretty good. Donna Tartt, The Goldfinch, was great. It's like 750 pages. I read it like in one week and I thought, she's got it and she's great and she's fantastic. Another American guy that I just read recently, uh, Colin McCann. Check him out. Colin McCann is really good. Okay, read everything you find at Colin McCann. But in general, okay, in general, you wanted to know the stuff that I read to write what I write, classics. I love the Russians. Um, I, love, I love Chekhov. And then Kapuscinski is this Polish guy um, who spent most of his life in Africa and wrote amazing stuff and he's been translated into English and I love him. He's a, Conrad is a, a guy I adore. If you're talking about the daily thing on my iPad, I have The New Yorker, The Economist, of course, Vanity Fair, a couple of crappy Italian newspapers, unfortunately, they're all bad. Um, and then I think I have The New York Review of Books, and I was like, and then, but daily, I mean, I subscribe to The New York Times, I read everything I can all the time about the things that I'm interested in, so I follow closely the Middle East, or I follow, I, I would like to do some Asian stuff, and I, I, go, I wanna go to Asia more often. So I have a daily routine of reading, but I, I don't read only magazines or newspapers, reading some good kind of old classic. And there are books that I read all over again. There, it's like Conrad, I can read Conrad every two years, the whole thing, because Conrad is like my hero, you know. Um, in the thing that I'm gonna give you tomorrow, there are like 20 books you're supposed to read. <laughs> so don't worry about the reading material, okay, I guess. <laughs> Um, when and why did you start observing yourself? When and why? Yeah. Like what age and then why did you begin to think of yourself first? Why were you curious about how you think? I think I said that um, because I couldn't dump my boyfriend. <laughs> no, seriously, seriously. I, I, think, I think I was unhappy. Unhappiness is really good unhappiness, to trigger kind of um, self-exploration uh, and observation. Unhappiness works all the time, I can guarantee you. So, so like you're feeling lost, you don't know what you're doing, nor who you are, and you feel like nothing is really working, and even things apparently are okay, you kind of feel this empty space inside of you and you don't know why, and then Somebody points you in the right direction and you finally, once you smash your face against the wall, you get there. I was supposed actually to go there. I, I, I saw a shrink when I was, my sister was a shrink. So I saw a shrink when I was 23, 24, but I wasn't ready. So I, I went there, I saw this woman once, I thought she was awful, that was the end of it. So you do this kind of process because it's rather painful. For a certain amount of time it's kind of painful, then it's great, then it's really great. Then it's, it gives you power. I had, it's like, of course I had my, my very downside, ah, and then it was like, ah, it was, like, it, was, it was kind of schizophrenic. But all of it very interesting, and it made for great copies, and I sold dreams. So, um, no, seriously, e eventually you find yourself in a very unhappy place, and, and you want to come out of it, and you don't know how, and you're correct. 
I have a question a little bit less about writing um, and more about what it's like to write for a magazine. So like, what is the relationship like between a writer and the magazine in which they have a column? With my editors, you mean? Just like, um, do you just like send them the writing? It's or fantastic, they... the column is fantastic. What happens is that once a week, once a month, they give me a deadline, uh -huh. which kind of changes, can, can, can be the 23rd or the 28th or whatever. They say, oh, we're waiting for your page by this date. I'll figure out what the column is. I'll send the column, end of the story, and then at the end of the month, I'll send them a check. That's the end of the story. Okay, so it's like, it's, they are, it's like very hands off. So it's totally, yeah, totally, okay. cool. completely, happily. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and did they find? Do they usually find like people who you write for? Do they usually find you because they? have seen what you're doing already and like it, or is it because they're like looking for a specific story? The readers? No, like the whoever you like submit your writing to. I don't submit right now because I have these two main gigs and that's it. Okay. So I, it's the end of the, the struggling freelancing years are over, alhamdulillah, mercifully. Yeah, <laughs> so I don't have to pitch anything. Okay. Yeah, I just have deadlines right now. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned knowing your audience and being able to write for an audience. Is there ever a time, though, that maybe writing for an audience limits your style or limits your voice in your own personal experience? Um, no, I mean, in my personal experience, that has never happened because um, I, what I wanted to do with the column and, do, and, and when we started thinking about the column was really kind of using my female side. Okay, I use a lot of my male side to go to war zones. And sometimes I was having these dreams about a little girl inside of me going to a mine and trying to dig up some gold and eventually buying some purple high heels shoes, okay? And, and I realized that um, I, as, as, a, as a woman and as a writer and as a reporter, um, to, get, to go to Kobana and cross the border illegally, uh, my main side has to be pretty uh, dare, right? Daring and, and uh, risk taking and all of that. But then in order to write stories and, 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 and to write also a column where I ask what it means and how I, f I feel about it, is where my, my female side kicks in. Am I making any sense? Okay. And so, and so basically when I start writing uh, uh, the column, um, when, when I talked to the editor, Mary Claire, about the column, um, and, uh, we discussed what it was going to be like. And the idea was, the, the title in Italian is Sconfinando. Roughly translated border chronicles means sconfinare means to go beyond the border, right? And the idea was like to go beyond the border, not only physically crossing a border, so the idea of traveling, but also to go beyond in general, deeper to add a, a meaning that is a bit more profound to whatever it was that I was experiencing and, 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 and encountering. So that all, it all came natural. It was what I wanted to do, give a voice to my little girl inside of me who was dreaming of, you know, go mining, and what they wanted. So what, when we established what it was going to be like, we never had a discussion again. And it was all kind of figuring out what to do every month with this page. Mm. Um, I have a question about the first place you were born. Mate you're from Matera, which is an amazing place. Yeah. And I'm curious um, about whether you feel that you are influenced in any way by where you come from. Oh, absolutely. Mm -hmm. And in how, how you feel that. <laughs> uh, how Matera in, in particular. <laughs> Well, I think I love the Middle East and I love the Arabs because I'm a southerner from southern Italy because I can recognize many things from the south of Italy in the Middle East because um, I felt at home in the Middle East and um, that's, that's pretty clear in my mind. It's pretty clear in my mind that the universe that I inhabited growing up as a little girl, that the universe that formed me when I was growing up, um, it was eventually the universe, a, a, a similar universe um, that, that I kind of uh, ch chose to, to explore in many sense. And, and um, we talked about trauma, but the, the, the fact, you see, basically Beirut or the Middle East is southern Italy with war. Now, 
war, you know, is conflict. And it can be external, boom, 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 bombardment, right? Or can be internal, right? We can be in conflict. We could have inner wars. And most, most of the time, our inner wars are externalized. You know, we project them, and, 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 and they become masses where a lot of people die. So um, what I discovered was that Beirut was a sort of metaphor of our lives, and my life, for sure, because Beirut was, was about the, um, the cruelty of conflict, the uncertainty of the future, and the need to water the roses and give iron to the vitamins, to take care of your garden if you wanted to get out of it. And um, this is why I was born in Madeira, and I was reborn in Beirut. We can declare the conference dead. Thank you very much. <laughs>